Now it's been a busy week for endoscopy news. We have the following headlines. Is the time right for endoscopic sleeve gastrectomy? Uh, do we at long last have a problem to address for a decade old solution? A new way to manage duodenal perforations perhaps? An ESG report on colonic, perfora- well, colonic adverse events? Um, something usually not mentioned when we talk about the management of difficult biliary stones. Air quality measurement in the endoscopy unit. Um, a new way of managing uh, non-resectable papillary cancers, perhaps. Meta-analysis of the management of uh, gastric type 1 NETs. A rethink, well at least made me rethink, uh, the management of angiodysplasias or angiectasias. And uh, when I get phone calls saying that they got, uh, there is an, um, a lower GI emergency, someone's come in bleeding, I often feel like saying, that's not a that's not an endoscopic emergency, and we have a study to tell us if it is now. Now, the first headline is uh, was a multicenter American study looking at endoscopic sleeve gastrectomy uh, in this uh, September issue of GIE. There was 105 patients underwent endoscopic uh, intervention, i.e. endoscopic sleeve gastrectomy, and they lost an average of 20% of their weight after 12 months. And uh, that compared to 14% in the control group, who did better well, I thought. And um, it's that result is not, by the way, out of kilter with previous studies. There's been meta-analysis of endoscopic sleep gastrectomies that put the success rate, af- after 24 months even, at up to 17% total body weight loss, which is good. So is the time right for endoscopic sleeve gastrectomy? Should we start doing it? Well, this study didn't address two problems with endoscopic sleeve gastrectomy. The first is that of complications. And um, <laughs> I don't know if this was the intention of the, of the uh, journal, but in the same issue of GIE, they had a video report of a patient who developed biliary peritonitis when he was treated by endoscopic sleeve gastrectomy and a stitch went through the gallbladder. <laughs> Nasty. Uh, we know from previous data that there, there are problems, there are issues with uh, uh, endoscopic sleep gastrectomy. The, that, those stitches go very, very deep, and uh, fluid collections, uh, abscesses, etc., complicate something around half a percent of the procedures, and they have bleeding in a further half percent, and then you have pain in, in around one percent. That's according to previous meta analysis. Now, so that is something of an issue, but perhaps less of an issue than surgery. But the second issue, which, which again this study didn't talk about at all, was um, was cost. They just mentioned that the total cost with endoscopic sleeve gastrectomy and the follow-up was $16,000. That's a lot of money. That's 14,000 euros for those who live in Europe. I wonder how many... How many uh, surgical operations I get, can get for that kind of money. Anyway, I guess they also said that this this would be a perhaps a solution for patients who don't want to have surgery for some reason. Um, is it time for endoscopic sleeve gastrectomy? I don't know. I don't think so. I think it's too expensive, guys. You need to lower the price of that. Now, as you probably know, I regard the Judenum as tiger country. And uh, the second study was a, uh, was also published in GIE, September issue. It was a multicenter Japanese study uh, looking at uh, ESD, the outcomes of ESD in duodenal adenomas. Uh, 14% of the patients suffered a perforation, and it was only possible to close the perforation in about a third of these patients. Nobody died, but the patients spent up to two months in hospital afterwards. Uh, Patients with polyps in the bulb did better, maybe because they're easier to close by clips, or perhaps because there's less pancreatic juice and bile sloshing about up in the bulb rather than in the D2. Um, and, and of course, patients who, had, who could have the perforation clip did f- far better, only stayed in hospital for, f- for four or five days. So, f- so far, no surprises then. The message is simple. Uh, don't go anywhere near the duodenum e- unless you got full backup 24-7, 365 days a week. I mean, surgical, specialized surgical backup. You don't want a, you want, don't want a breast surgeon having a go at sorting out a duodenal perforation. You want someone who, if need be, can carry out a pancreatic duode- duodenectomy, a Whipple's operation at 4 o'clock in the morning. So many of those places around. 
Uh, the second thing is that uh, is that the, the Japanese manage perforations in a very interesting way that I never thought of. First of all, they had these polycolic, poly, polyglycolic sheets that they stuffed into the perforation. They did admit that it didn't seem to do much. But the second thing they did was they poked a, a nasobiliary drain uh, into into the into the common bile duct, and then a separate nasopancreatic duct drain into the pancreatic duct. Presumably, the patient at the end of it had a, had a tube in each nostril to to kind of drain away the bile and the pancreatic juices. It's interesting. I think there might be something in it because only, if I understand the paper right, only two patients are, uh, actually ended up with uh, with with, a, with an operation. And that's not my experience. Whenever I've made a perforation in the in the duodenum, everyone invariably have ended up with surgery. And maybe these these nasal drains is the way ahead. Um, then on the other hand, it doesn't really apply to my practice. You see, he, unless the, the patient got a, a papillary adenoma, I wouldn't do the the procedure in under fluoroscopy. So if if it was if it happened with on on my watch. I would have to, if I made a perforation in the duty, and I would have, have to run out of the room, try to barge into the into our fluoroscopy, our screening room, try to talk a, a, an ERC pist into coming in and rescue me, and of course we will need to have some of those Cook uh, nasal biliary and pancreatic duct stents handy. Uh, this other person will have to drop everything immediately because the minutes matter if there's a perforation. You can't hang about. Uh, you need to get those those tubes in immediately. Frankly, I can't really see it happening, to be honest. And if the big perforation, uh, what can happen, of course, as you keep inflating the duodenum, you start to get splintic of the diaphragm and you'll find 20 minutes later that the patient's saturation begins to drop. It's game over. You need to, you need to stop. The, this patient needs to go tie to you. So in practical terms, unless, unless you're in a fluoroscopy room, unless you're a trained ERCPist, I, see, I find it difficult to imagine that, um, um, that I can take on this kind of practice. But then again, maybe only ERCPists should remove uh, duodenal uh, uh, polyps. However, that is not in the core job description. Uh, ERCPists deal with stones and pancreatic ducts. They don't, on the whole, remove neoplastic t uh, lesions. Tricky. Next study was uh, an ASG review of adverse events uh, in colonoscopy. They basically reported that the risk of a perforation is about 1 in 1750 or thereabouts. Uh, interestingly, I didn't know this, the risk is far higher in patients with, with uh, inflammatory bowel disease. I didn't know that. Um, and particularly if they're, if they're actually on steroids at the time of the colonoscopy. According to this review, that increases the risk 13-fold. I had no idea. Um, of course, the risk is, even, is, is also very high if you, you remove a polyp by ESD versus EFR. Uh, ESD will, will increase the risk of a perforation 8-fold uh, compared to, to an EMR. The risk of bleeding, by the way, is the same, whether the polyp is removed by snare polypectomy, EMR, or ESD, and it's largely related to the size of the polyp, so no news there. Pre-injection, by the way, with adrenaline into the stalk of the polyp will, of course, reduce the risk of an immediate bleeding, but what did you expect? Didn't have any effect on late bleeding. Of course, you don't expect to. The, the adrenaline will, will be absorbed after 20 minutes, and then it, you're back to square one, aren't you? So it only gives you enough peace and quiet to... to to resect the polyp and put the clips in place to reduce late bleeding. And they did agree that the clips reduce the risk of late bleeding. But interestingly, they said that they seem to do so mostly in the proximal colon. Makes no sense at all. Of course, it works everywhere. It's just that no studies have been able to confirm it as yet. Um, Interestingly, gastroenterologists uh, had, a lower, uh, had a lower risk of complications than surgeons. Uh, uh, and um, endoscopists doing fewer than 140 colonoscopies a year uh, that was in the lowest quintile had the worst outcomes. No surprise. 
And then in the October issue, due to be published in the journal Endoscopy, we had a review of cholangioscopy, spyglass, in patients with difficult biliary stones. And to remind you, a difficult biliary stone is defined as a stone which is 15 millimeter in diameter or bigger. Its previous uh, uh, attempts at clearance have failed, impacted stones, multiple stones, stones in the hepatic, uh, intrahepatic ducts, stones above a stricture. And basically, this multicenter study uh, reported an 80% success rate to clear difficult stones in a single sitting. Uh, well, I was thinking, this is hardly news, but um, it, may be, it may be recall a recent conversation we had in Leeds about a referral. It was an elderly, um, elderly asymptomatic patient who on CT had been found to have hydropathic biliary stones and upstream dilatation uh, and dilatation at the side of these stones in two different areas of the of the liver and he had been referred to Leeds for uh, cholangioscopy of course and then you start thinking about it this this old patient he's completely asymptomatic uh, why would you go anywhere near these stones after all if there are two cholangiocarcinomas you wouldn't operate because he's got mul multifocal disease and then you can only offer him chemotherapy, but you wouldn't give chemotherapy to someone with uh, with uh, um, intrahepatic bile duct stones. Uh, and of course, a heroic attempt to try to kind of um, uh, reach these stones will inevitably turn him into someone who's now septic with cholangitis. Um, so of course, if you start thinking about it, and this study, no studies indeed, is actually um, uh, reflecting on this. Actually, in many of these cases, not doing anything is, do, is to do the right thing. Worth remembering, isn't it? Now, every time I use APC, it makes me think that th those gases, those vapors aren't right for you. And uh, there was a study in this week's uh, mm -hmm. journal, Surgical Endoscopy, which had looked at air quality standards in endoscopy units, I think, in South Korea. Basically, they found that uh, the air quality wasn't good. The, the PM 2.5 uh, levels, those are the 2.5 micron particles that, that we breathe in, goes through our, uh, our alveolar membrane, ends up in our bloodstream and in our brains and in the placenta and all in, 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 in unborn babies and everywhere, uh, nasty. And the nitrox levels were particularly high in the cleaning room where the minimum standards were breached about one third of the time. Uh, the level of CO2 and total volatile organic compounds was highest in the procedure room, no, no surprises there, uh, where the minimum air standards were breached about 26% of the time. I think we should start looking into our air quality here in our endoscopy rooms. God knows what's going on with the PM 2.5, Vox, CO2 and nitrous oxide levels. I think we should, uh, we should all start paying, paying a bit of attention to that. Now, every now and again, we have a patient with an inoperable and non-endoscopic resectable papillary cancer here in Leeds. And there was a study in, in this week's Digestive Diseases and Sciences, which looked at the option of RFA in these cancers. Basically, they looked at, uh, looked at 23 patients. Uh, in nine of the 23 patients, the lesion com uh, disappeared completely uh, over a two-year period. And in a further third, uh, there was a marked reduction in the size of the cancer. Uh, two years later, half of the patients were still alive, and half of them ha but half of them had a CBD stent in situ. Uh, there were adverse events, of course. There were, there were uh, four cases of pancreatitis out of 23, one patient out of 23 had bleeding, and there were two late papillary stenosis. There wasn't a control group, of course. We don't know how these patients would have managed without RFA. But it's an interesting option, isn't it, that, that we perhaps could, uh, could start offering patients with uh, inoperable disease. Now, in this week's World Journal of Gastroenterology, there was an interesting meta-analysis of the management of uh, type 1 gastric NETs, neuroendocrine tumors. You remember, the, the, these are the majority of uh, neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, it arises in an atrophic st stomach, often multiple, uh, small, and with a low risk of turning cancerous. Uh, basically, uh, in this meta-analysis, the, the authors confirmed that lesions up to 10 millimeters had an extremely low risk of lymph node metastases. But if the lesion were 10 millimeter or larger, the, the risk of lymph node metastases jumped up to 15% compared to 0.8% for smaller lesions. That's amazing. Of course, you, the, the other thing that predicted lymph node metastases was if the muscle propria 
was invaded by the NET tissue. And of course you won't know that unless you resect these lesions full thickness. So you get a bit of muscle propria um, in the specimen as well. Otherwise you won't know. And that was the only thing that, apart from size, that seemed to predict the risk of lymph node metastases. Um, so I think any small NETs should either be removed surgically or they should be removed uh, full thickness. Otherwise, you, um, you can't really predict the risk of lymph node metastases. Looking at the mitotic rate uh, didn't, didn't make a difference. Uh, a bit scary, I thought. Now, there was a meta-analysis from Ireland in this week's uh, Digestive Diseases and Sciences, which looked at uh, 92,000 uh, endoscopies and, um, and angio angiodysplasia. Basically, they, they, they looked at these, uh, at these examinations to see if you could predict who would become anemic subsequently after finding angiodysplasia. And, and as you recall, angiodysplasia, the current, uh, the current gold standard is to not to, um, uh, try to ablate them unless the patient is anemic. And this study made me think that might, maybe we, that, might be, that might be the wrong thing to do because they, they found, and I guess this is rocket science really, that patients with kidney disease, heart disease, cirrhosis on anticoagulant or those with multiple angioectasias were much more likely to become anemic in the future. Now the alterations were, were huge. They, they ranged from 1.1 up to 16. Uh, but it may nevertheless made me think that maybe what we should do when we find angioctasia in, in a frail patient like this, maybe we should actually reach for the APC probe and, and ablate them to reduce the risk of the patient turning uh, uh, anemic uh, in the future. Now, I've been around long enough uh, to know that trying to find a colonic bleeding site in a patient with acute lower GI bleeding is usually futile. The reason is that it's always impossible to get the colon clean enough. So you end up doing colonoscopy in a, in a blood bath. You can't see a thing. And, and the whole thing is, is, is a little bit stupid and futile in retrospect. So I was therefore glad to see a Japanese uh, multicenter study um, looking into this in, in the journal of gastroenterology, the October issue. Basically, this study randomized 170 patients to either having an, an uh, early colonoscopy within 24 hours or a late colonoscopy uh, after presentation, which was anywhere, anytime between 24 hours and 96 hours later. Uh, and what do you expect to find? There was no difference in the proportion of patients uh, in which a, a bleeding site was identified. It was 21% in both early and late uh, examinations. The risk of rebleeding, the same. Uh, the the, the um, transfusion requirement, the same. Length of stay, the same. Thrombotic events, the same. Risk of death after 30 days, the same. Uh, so. The next time someone is phoning me after three o'clock in the morning trying to get me out of bed because of, a, of an emergency lower GI bleed, I'm going to tell them there is no such thing. And that is the last of the articles that caught my eye this week. Thank you very much for listening.